Next up, we have Michael Bly from Google, who will be talking to us about what it, what it means to create API products at scale. Um, without further ado, welcome, Michael. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, as she said, I am Michael Bly. And one of my jobs on the Firebase team is to lead Firebase's API council. Um, I've been helping shape APIs at Firebase for more than five years, and I thought you might want to hear a bit about an exciting topic that I know you're all very interested in, uh, <laughs> and that is process and governance. So, all right, on second thought, maybe it doesn't seem that exciting. Does this help at all? Uh, in any case, whether it's exciting or not, Process and governance are critical to the long-term health of your company's APIs. Since this is a developer experience conference, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, but APIs are kind of important to the de developer experience. The APIs on the left and the right here convey the exact same information, but as a developer, I can certainly say that one of them seems a little bit easier to use. And you can laugh at this contrived example, but honestly, I've seen real world APIs that are close to this bad. Don't let that be you. The good news is that building a good API is straightforward. Well, okay, it's not really straightforward, but it is something that anyone can do with a bit of practice and empathy for your users. Good APIs generally have some similarities. They are intuitive. Users of the API can quickly pick up the concepts and structures needed to consume the API. You should have a well-lit path for common use cases that is really streamlined and optimized. Good APIs are well-documented. An API with no documentation may as well not exist. No part of your API should be mysterious to developers. A good API is flexible. One of the greatest powers of public APIs are the community-driven use cases that were never imagined by the creators of the API. APIs can't be so tightly coupled to narrow use cases that they can't be made to do unexpected things. Good APIs are idiomatic. APIs are more than just HTTP endpoints, of course. They're also SDKs, tools like CLIs, configuration languages, and more. Good APIs should feel natural to the environment that they're in. And finally, a good API is comprehensive. While common cases should be easy, all edge cases should be possible with a good API. Giving users an API can be an escape hatch that can bridge gaps that are otherwise impossible. None of these things are simple or easy, but they can be learned and with practice applied, which is why I said, that building a good API is at least a little bit straightforward. But something that many people don't think about is what happens to even good APIs over time. Building a good API is straightforward at first. Maintaining a good API over time can be really difficult. And I think it's because it's hard for us to conceptualize API maintenance. We want to think of building an API like building anything else. You start with a plan, you execute the plan, you end up with a finished product. But I would argue that building APIs is a little bit more like this slime mold. APIs are organic. You keep adding new things to them, things that you hadn't considered in your original plans. APIs pull apart and come together in strange ways over time. So while we have all the same ingredients that we need to add up to a good API, that's just what we need to have a good API on day one from the start. There are additional critical attributes of good APIs that only become apparent as we manage them over a long period of time. Over time, in addition to all of the other things I've already talked about, good APIs will be stable. Code that I write against an API should keep working a month, six months, a year, five years from now, ideally. Breaking changes do sometimes happen, but they should be relatively rare and compatibility layers should be offered as much as possible. A good API is going to be used by many people, which means that if you break it, many people are going to be broken. Good APIs will also be consistent over time. A new API that I launched today should look and feel in place with an API that I launched five years ago. 
Now your APIs will, the style of your APIs will evolve over time. It's not just going to stay the same, but you should do that carefully and you should do that in a coordinated way so that it, your APIs always feel natural. Finally, good APIs will be compatible with the tools their users prefer. Platforms and frameworks are evolving all the time and good APIs need to evolve to meet those new use cases. Five years ago, I might not have thought, hey, I need to make sure that my, co my API supports declarative infrastructure like Terraform, but I would certainly think about that as I'm building APIs today. It's important to be aware of what your community is doing so that you can make sure that your APIs meet the challenges and the tooling that they're familiar with. So it's these good APIs over time attributes that I'm mostly going to focus on today. Maintaining high quality APIs is not a passive endeavor. There are forces you must actively fight against if you want the high quality API you shipped last week to remain high quality two years from now. One of those forces is Hiram's law, which tells us that undocumented behaviors will nevertheless become dependencies for customers over time. This can become particularly problematic when you're trying to perform an API stable infrastructure migration. You build the new backend to match the existing contract, you begin rolling it out, and suddenly you have a deluge of furious customers who are broken despite nothing that you knew to worry about changing. Another force is Conway's law that is referred to colloquially in Google as shipping your org chart. As your team grows and the number of contributors to your API surface increases, it's natural for parts of the API surface with different owners to drift apart over time. Just as geographic separation can lead to new dialects of spoken language, organizational separation can lead to many dialects in the same API surface. Finally, there's the second law of thermodynamics. Any system, no matter how well organized, will become more disordered over time. All API changes inject additional complexity. If you keep adding tiny bits of complexity without carefully managing them, you'll soon find yourself coming back to something that is almost unrecognizable. I've experienced all of these problems firsthand at working at Firebase. If you ask 10 developers, what is Firebase? You might get 10 radically different answers. And that's because Firebase offers more than 15 products that span everything from data storage to crash reporting to serverless compute, experimentation, and analytics. What's more, Firebase offers most of these products across a wide variety of platforms, supporting mobile devices, games, and web. At Firebase, we can't just ship REST APIs and call it a day. We're known for our high quality SDKs and tooling as well. When you take that many products times that many platforms, you have more than 100 unique API services. It's a lot. And while your company may not yet have 100 plus API services to worry about, you absolutely can improve your APIs for the long term by leveraging the same tools as Firebase. And what tools are those? Well, process and governance, of course. Six years ago, Firebase created a process for public API changes. Through it, anyone can submit a proposal for an API change, not unlike the RFC processes you might have seen in open source projects or elsewhere. In addition, an API council was established from team members with API expertise who would be responsible for reviewing and approving these proposals. Here's how it works. Let's say that I'm an author of an API proposal. Now, this same process applies whether I'm adding a single new option to a single SDK or whether I'm proposing a massive set of new APIs for a new product launch. As an author, I need to fill out an API proposal, which has a number of sections for Firebase. We have a summary, code samples, pros and cons of the proposal, the detailed API signature changes, any impact on errors or logging, any impact on cross-platform, deprecations, and customer feedback. Let me highlight a few of those in a little more detail. Code samples are one of the things that are critical to our API process, and we put them right at the top of the proposal. Because it's not just about what is the API signature change, it's about how are the users actually going to implement this API? What's it going to look like in the day-to-day -day code? This is how we make sure that the well-lit path is actually streamlined. 
Deprecations are also critical. Does this proposal deprecate an existing API? How will that deprecation be handled? On what timeline? As I mentioned before, breaking changes should be avoided whenever possible and must be carefully managed to avoid harming customer trust. Let me give you a specific example. Firebase released a big breaking change of its JavaScript SDKs last year. The call signatures of nearly every method in the entire SDK and its dozen or so product SDKs changed pretty significantly. But wait, I already hear you saying. I thought you said breaking changes should be avoided and stability was a hallmark of a good API. Well, that's true, but sometimes breaking changes are unavoidable. We had heard feedback for years that the JavaScript SDK was simply too heavy. Its structure made it impossible for modern JavaScript tooling, like tree shaking, to work for, with it. There was no way to pay as you go, and entire SDKs either were loaded or they weren't. The V9 JavaScript SDK made payloads as much as 85% smaller for certain use cases and a significant amount smaller for almost all use cases. We rewrote the API to be compatible with all the modern tooling developers had begun using since the SDKs were first built nearly a decade before. The wins for the breaking change were clear, but there were an enormous number of applications that were already built using the old SDKs. We couldn't just leave them in the dust. So the new JavaScript SDK also came with a compatibility layer. This offered a veneer over the new SDK shape that looked almost exactly like the previous API with a different import path. By providing the compatibility layer, developers could migrate to the new SDK without actually having to make sweeping changes to their code, then gradually migrate to the new call signatures over time. The rewrite took more than two years, all told, but it's been a big win with our users in no small part because we were very intentional about our deprecation strategy. A last part of the API proposal that I want to mention is customer feedback. Is this proposal addressing customer feedback? How so? This helps ground our proposals in the concrete problems of users and helps us not miss potential edge cases. We review the feedback, whether that's a GitHub issue filed on a public repo or uh, various feature requests that have been filed by users over time or support cases that we receive and we make sure that API proposals are addressing the actual problems that our users are having uh, correctly. And one more note here, since many parts of Firebase are open source, sometimes an API change is actually being proposed by one of our customers in one of our public repos with someone from the Firebase team sponsoring it internally. These are some of my favorite changes because it's really cool to see the community actually changing the public API service of Firebase. Okay, so now we're all the way back to our API process. We've just written a proposal using the sections I described. Once the proposal is ready, the author submits it for general review. At this point, two groups will look at the proposal. API reviewers, who are volunteer members of the Firebase team who look at proposals on an ad hoc basis, and platform experts. We identify one primary expert for each of the platforms Firebase cares about and give extra consideration to their feedback especially about writing code that is idiomatic and consistent with existing APIs on that platform. We have a mechanism for indicating approval of a proposal. Not everyone will review every proposal, but during this stage, there's some good commentary and discussion. After the general review period, which is usually around two to three days, the author will request formal approval of the API from the council. The API council of Firebase currently has five members, and a three-member quorum is required to approve a proposal. Formal approval sometimes happens in a meeting that we automatically schedule when the author requests formal review, but oftentimes we approve proposals asynchronously after a round or two of comments on the proposal. The volunteer group of API reviewers also serves as a recruitment pipeline for the Firebase API Council, providing continuity and a solid on-ramp as the team changes over time. Once a proposal has three council members approving, it's go for launch. Our entire process is targeted to take less than two weeks from start to finish, and we generally hit that with, except for particularly larger complex proposals that might need uh, multiple rounds of feedback. So one thing you might be wondering is, how do you make sure that the process is actually followed? After all, 
teams are often under a lot of pressure to ship new features quickly, and even a relatively fast process might be seen as a corner to cut. If a governance process is going to be effective, there needs to be enforcement. In Firebase, no public API is allowed to launch without approval from the API Council. We work with teams to get them involved in the process early, but we can and sometimes do block launches to work through these issues with the APIs. It's an important and core part of our overall release strategy, and it's been incorporated well enough that most teams know that they need to just get in there right away. So there you have it. This is how APIs are made at Firebase. There's just one more piece missing, and it's right from the title of the talk, scale. Because remember, Firebase has over 100 unique API surfaces that we have to worry about, and any team can propose a change at any time. In practice, we get more than 160 proposals per year, which works out to three to four per week. We've had proposals from as many as 85 different authors in a single year. To scale our process, we've done a few different things. First, we've built some tools. This is a screenshot of an internal tool the API Council uses during our working sessions to prioritize proposals for review. But there's an even more powerful tool for scale. If enforcement helps make sure we maintain a high quality bar, to improve API proposals out of the gate, we need reinforcement. We extract common patterns into a style guide that we call AIPs, short for API Improvement Proposals. This actually wasn't a Firebase specific innovation, but something that happened at the Google level and is public and open source. If you go to google.aip.dev, you can read the canonical guidance for all of Google's REST APIs. This was an effort by the Google API team and it's had a huge effect on the quality of Google's APIs. By having a central, easily citable source of truth for the right thing to do, many more people will do the right thing by default. Google has even built a linter that will enforce many of these API rules automatically internally. The better shape an API is when it first gets proposed, the faster and smoother the whole process works. This has been a really great tool and I would really encourage you to implement some kind of API style guide and just as you're making decisions, what shape should this API be? What should we call this kind of field? Write them down. You may change your mind later with more evidence, but it's great to have a reference point. I know that this was a lot of material in a very short time, but this process has had a huge effect on Firebase throughout the years. By centralizing API governance, we fight the forces of shipping the org chart. By making sure that every change goes through the same process and documenting patterns, we minimize the entropy introduced by each change. And at this point, you might be thinking, hey, look, I don't work for a giant tech company. I don't have more than 100 API surfaces with dozens of people changing them. And I'm not here to tell you to add more process and governance than necessary, but I am here to tell you that if you care about developer experience, maintaining a high bar for API quality should be someone's job. Maybe you don't need a process as heavy as what Firebase does, but you do need someone to make sure that your APIs start good and just as importantly, stay good over time. So please, don't look at words like process and governance and think, what a useless waste of time. Think of it as a way to help your team keep an excellent developer experience, no matter how big and complex the surface area becomes. When we surveyed authors of API proposals from last year about their experience with the Firebase API Council, 100% of them agreed that their API was better because of their engagement with the process. And the implication of that is that 100% of those APIs would have been worse if we didn't have this process in place. So despite the fact that process and governance can seem like useless overhead, we've actually found in Firebase that people who engage with the API process find that they're learning more about what makes a high quality API, that their engagement with the council is usually productive and ends with a better API, and it's generally been a really successful thing for Firebase. That's all I've got for today. Thanks so much for listening. And if you have any questions about making and maintaining good APIs, I'm happy to answer them. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. That was an amazing talk. I um, 
I was taking a lot of notes just because um, there's quite a bit of discussion recently internally at, Git, uh, at Gitpod uh, where we've been discussing APIs and I'm really looking forward to sending this video to everyone because um, there were so many amazing take home messages. Um, so we actually have a question here from the audience uh, from Jeffrey who asks, do you monitor which customers are using which part of the API or which parts are not used much? Does this impact how you handle changes? So we have some fairly coarse monitoring of API surfaces, but since many of our APIs are client SDKs, um, we don't collect any kind of detailed usage information about which methods are being called. We do talk to our developer community all the time, which means that you know, we have a pretty good idea just from sort of anecdotal evidence who's using what and how much. Um, and we definitely will take uh, we we will take customer feedback to overrule our own decisions. So, if the API Council has made a decision on you know we think this is the right way, but then it's in the private preview and users strongly feel the other way, then we we will like that's the evidence that we care about because ultimately the users of the API are the important folks. And so um, as an example with the V9 JavaScript SDK, um, we were originally going to require that the uh, app container be passed to every different method that you, uh, when you were getting an individual product API. And we got feedback from developers that that was too much of a hassle. And so we sort of reverted back to something more uh, to a default uh, that we had had in the V8 SDKs. And so it's, yeah, a lot of this is just about listening to your customers, going with the intuition that you've built up, um, you know, working with APIs over a long period of time. But, you know, ultimately the, the customers decide whether the API is good or not. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Listening, actually listening to the people who would be using it. That makes sense. Thank you so much for that uh, question, um, Jeffrey. I uh, just wanted to throw in some comments again from Jeffrey. Great talk, really glad I saw this. Amazing. We don't, unless anyone else has any more questions for Michael, feel free to quickly drop them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I think uh, that, I don't have any questions myself. I think you, I actually wrote down quite a few questions, but as you were going through the, your talk, I was like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna ask that again. Uh, but yeah, that was, it, it was a great talk, uh, Michael. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. Um, if, actually, if uh, people want to ask you some more questions or connect with you, where's the best place? Uh, my Twitter is probably the easiest place to get a hold of me. So that's M. Bly, first initial, last name uh, on Twitter. And I am always happy to geek out about APIs. Yeah, amazing. I'll probably um, ask you a few questions once I share this talk internally. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us to DevXConf and all your contributions. Uh, and we'll see you again, hopefully, maybe next year. All right. Thanks a lot, Pauline.